Uh, welcome to the 26th meeting in 2022 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. I would like to remind everyone present to switch their mobile phones to silent. I also would like to uh, acknowledge the apologies from Oliver Mandel, who couldn't uh, be with the uh, committee today. The first item of business is to decide whether to take items 7, 8 and 9 in private. Is the committee content to take these items in private? Yeah. Moving to agenda item number two today, we are continuing to take evidence on the movable transactions at Scotland Bill across two panels. The first panel is online. So the first panel, can I welcome Colin Borland, the Director of the Devolved Nations Federation of Small Businesses. And joining us uh, also is Mirka, uh, Mirka Sheepjack, Head of Working Capital and Trade Products at NatWest. Uh, good morning, panel. So, first of all, can I remind both uh, attendees, uh, don't worry about um, attending to uh, uh, make us aware that you want to speak, because uh, uh, we'll bring you in automatically. <coughs> so, uh, with that, I'm going to start the questions to the panel number one. So, the one of the things that, uh, this is uh, first of all to the FSB, uh, one of the things that has come up in the evidence um, so far has been the issue of cash flow, and that certainly can be an issue for all businesses, but particularly small businesses. Um, can, uh, can you provide just a, a bit more background information uh, to that as an issue, uh, Mr Borland? Um, particularly, um, I think it's, it's fair to say that certainly from 2008, the, the financial and trading conditions for the small business sector it will have been extremely difficult uh, in Scotland and also across the UK. Uh, and, uh, and clearly, we're also in a, in a current situation which is clearly financially challenging also. Yes, um, thanks very much. Yeah, 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 I mean, absolutely right. And I think we, we made the point in the written evidence that, well, the that it's not a lack of profitability that kills businesses, but a lack of cash. and. All firms' cash flow is often interrupted by things like the late payment of sums that's um, already owed to them. Um, you know, that's a particular real long standing problem. Um, the policy memorandum quotes, I think, our original evidence to the Scottish Law Commission that at the time they said people have thousands of small businesses in Scotland fold each year because their invoices remain unpaid. <coughs> Excuse me. And more recently, um, it's true to say that it's becoming worse. I mean, our latest small business confidence index, which was just published last week, shows that over half of all small businesses in Scotland are continue to be beset by late payments. Um, and a third have seen an increase in over the last three months. Um, and I think our written evidence also says that over one in 10 small firms, or 12%, say that late payment is now threatening the viability um, of the business. Now, that's against the backdrop. Um, as we know, and I won't you know, uh, detain the committee by telling you all the stuff you already know, but we know that prices are going up, inputs are going up, revenues which have been made up in about um, are beginning to be um, to fall. That obviously we're seeing um, profits, if there's any profit left, the business is going um, completely. So there really is a reliance on um, Shorter term solutions um, that help um, that help cash flow. I mean, if it, just, um, if it would be helpful, um, I can just run through a very quick snapshot of how businesses tend to fund their operations at, at, at the moment. Um, so, if you look back, I mean, I'm, I'm taking this from the first March 2020, and that's simply because that's before all the COVID emergency loans came in, which is about four billion pounds in Scotland and takes up quite a chunk of businesses' debt. But if you look at the overall um, the overall picture. First March, about over half, 56% of small business owners had some form of debt. 46% um, of that half were using their business bank account overdraft. 38% relying on business credit cards. 30% personal credit cards. So the top three there um, are all pretty flexible forms of finance, typically to help with the daily worry costs to your business. Um, and the most, you know, again, still, I mean, the most common forms of finance acquired by small businesses in recent years, leaving the COVID loans aside, which have got all the rules, um, overdraft facilities, credit cards, and asset finance. But what that strongly suggests to me is that in the market as a whole, 
flexibility in financing is the most important to small business borrowers, which I think makes this legislation, which on the one hand could be seen as quite dry and technical, but actually could be potentially quite significant because um, if it succeeds in its aims of broadening access to that sort of financial solution, is that helpful? Yeah, that certainly was helpful. Thank you. Um, so, are you aware of any particular difficulties for the small business sector accessing invoice financing in Scotland? And if so, uh, what impact does this actually have? Um, well, yeah, the things of factoring and raising money by selling debt obligations, I think it's lost a lot of the stigma that it's had in the past, but it does remain a relatively expensive form of finance. So, this have a so look yesterday at some some things and some guides suggesting that you can see APR highs of about forty eight percent. And of course you're accepting less than face value for the invoice, but at the same time you're also outsourcing your credit control, which can be a costly and time consuming drag on business. So I think the, the industry will probably be a better place than me to have a view of whether there are particular issues in Scotland. But I mean if you can bring down the cost of administering invoice financing then you can hopefully drive more competition in the market and get a prices for your business. And obviously that is one of the, you know, the stated aims of the proposed legislation is to make you know, is to reduce some of the you know some of the burden, some of the time, some of the processes and all of the everything that goes round about um, you know, um, looking at you know assignation. Um, and if it succeeds in doing that, then yeah, there's definitely cost, there's definitely opportunity there. I think um, to get costs down and make it up, you know, make it up a better option for more people. Questions for uh, for Mirka. Uh, from a lender's perspective, uh, how does the current law in Scotland impact on your lending options? Uh, good morning. Um, well, uh, Scots regime uh, currently presents particular challenges. Uh, which uh, in some instances definitely present significant obstacles to provision of finance and in other cases significantly adds to costs, uh, including workarounds. So that means it reduces the, the quantities of finance that would be otherwise available under alternative regimes. And I may also follow on the, the example used by, by Colin. Colin is absolutely right. Um, overdrafts are most common uh, financing instruments for businesses trying to manage their working capital. But the purpose of this bill is looking at security effectively and how we um, perfect security rights against an asset. Um, we talked about invoice finance. Um, invoice finance is not one term. There are multiple forms of invoice finance. The most common one are actually currently in the United Kingdom uh, across all the, um, all the countries comprising the United Kingdom is invoice discounting, not factoring. And an invoice discounting is not disclosed to the debtors. Factoring, which is going uh, significantly in decline, uh, indeed is more expensive uh, because factoring also constitutes credit control element, which means a lender takes the duties of chasing debt on behalf of our customers. Um, as NatWest, we recently exited factoring product because our customers uh, were moving and switching on to invoice discounting. So if you think about factoring in itself, then current regime doesn't necessarily press too many challenges because factoring facilities are fully disclosed to the debtors anyway. So the debtor intimation happens under factoring agreement because we're stepping in to chase the debt on behalf of our customers. Hence, you will always have more pricey factoring facility and inverse discounting. Um, as I said, the industry is moving away from providing factoring because the market's demand is, um, is vanishing for factoring. Because companies are using, um, for example, various new accounting software companies that chase debt on their behalf. Hence, we can see the rise of inverse discounting that is pushing uh, factoring out. And current regime in Scots law presents challenges to inverse discounting. Because inverse discounting, actually, in many instances, <laughs> is cheaper than overdraft facilities, but it's also undisclosed to the debtors. So when a, a business tries to raise money through their invoice discounting facility, um, which operates on a whole ledger, it's just sales ledger balance that is notified to the lender, the lender gives them the availability against the sales ledger balance. We don't look at any invoices, it's, it's quite 
straightforward, far simpler than factoring. But under Scots law, I have to have that intimation to the debtors. So under the current regime, I would have to notify debtors in order to uh, um, basically um, pass the title of the debts to, to the bank. So what we do now, we have a, an expensive workarounds when we create a trust language and a trust mechanism um, with our customers. Now, this is the problem because A, it's costly. It definitely needs to involve third party lawyers for drafting some of those agreements and, and help our customers to really understand what it means, what this trust mechanism means to them. Uh, and also, for a lender's perspective, it presents huge challenges because it's never been tested. So we're kind of operating it in order to provide the finance. But what it means, we tend to provide invoice financing facilities, i.e. invoice discounting, to slightly bigger businesses as opposed to the smaller ones because of the cost challenges and because of the untested nature of this workaround um, that, that gives us challenges. So that is, that is the, the, hence the proposed changes to the law on assignation in Scotland uh, will be definitely welcome from invoice finance perspective. It doesn't only go as far as, it, it goes way beyond invoice finance. Um, supply chain finance facilities are also very important and we're seeing them on the rise. When, when we have um, companies that have concentrations to big blue chip debtors, for example, um, I currently in, in English law rely on the uh, receivables purchase agreement um, which uh, allows me to take security for current and and in future receivables. Um, that uh, ability under current Scots law is not competent. So we cannot really uh, take an assignment of all present and future receivables. It's not valid. This bill changes that, uh, which again makes it far easier to execute because currently I have to create that corroborative assignation and transfer of the receivable um, into trust on every notification of debt. So again, it's admin heavy for businesses. I, I pause there in case there are any questions before we move to the, uh, the changes to the law of pledges, unless you want to hear the impact of that as well. Uh, if you can do that at the moment, that'd be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, no, no, no problem. So, in terms of uh, the uh, so, so, in terms of the law of pledges, this is used mostly for uh, what we will call fixed assets, planning machinery, for example, or any other assets who uh, a lender can uh, evaluate and provide financing to businesses. So, currently under Scots law, uh, the concept of chattel mortgages is not recognised. So, and uh, obtaining a pledge. Um, and possession of the assets is, is very impractical and, and does limit companies' access to finance. So, in order to provide financing against planning machinery, for example, which again, and the English law constitutes a fixed asset, I can effectively only get into a floating charge position, which means I have to put a number of reserves in place, which again, squeezes the availability of funding business could raise in order to uh, satisfy the working capital requirements. So the more I have to put in order to ensure that at the exit, the value of the assets versus the funding of the assets is safe from a risk perspective, um, uh, the less the money is available to, to businesses. What the new uh, proposal uh, in the bill creates is that ability to almost have a fix, effective fixed charge against planning machinery. So, so that's really the, the key impacts in terms of businesses' access to finance. Um, of course, we need to think at the administrative um, um, ways of managing those, those registers because they need to be accessible and effective. But both changes to the, um, uh, to the law on ass assignations as well as the law of pledges, uh, will definitely increase access to finance and ability to do it at a lower cost. Okay, no, thank you for that. I know certainly the, the issue of floating charges will come up in questioning uh, shortly. Um, so but on, on that final point regarding the, the access to finance, uh, so just for clarification then, do you, do you see opportunities from the, this bill 
to in, uh, regarding the invoice financing to actually open up new sources of funding for small businesses? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, through through this, uh, the access to financing for small businesses will be far far better. They don't need to worry then about the workarounds and the trust mechanism, which for some of them is hard to understand. Hence, they uh, decide not to proceed. Um, and as I said, because of the inverse discounting, which is entirely confidential, i.e. the debtors are not aware of our involvement, it again allows them to access those facilities uh, without any need to intimate debtors. Okay, no, thank you. And one final question from me at the moment, and uh, is regarding the, uh, just uh, uh, the larger business sector in Scotland. Are you aware of any advantages uh, to the larger businesses from the reforms to invoice financing? proposed in the bill? I know you've touched yeah, upon so a couple of points there, but... It, absolutely. I mean, the, the cost for them is there as well. So, so for them, again, we might need to think um, we are able to um, perfect our security interest far easier, uh, which means we can provide better advance rates uh, against the sales ledger balances for those bigger businesses. Absolutely. Okay, no, thank you. Because we control, we can prepare the security. So, in a very, if you have a large business, the large business is small as well, but the large business seasonality is very, very visible and it's very impacting, uh, it impacts the operating profit generation. If I, uh, and most businesses are seasonal actually. Um, so, if I have huge volatility in seasonality, I'll be very cautious what is the maximum advance rate I can put against sales ledger balances, because under current regime, I kind of have limited decision-making powers as to when I can perfect my security. And that means I'm cautious. With this new bill, I will effectively have fixed charge rights. So other than crown preference that ranks ahead of me, I am ranking ahead of IP, my insolvency practitioner, and can perfect my security at the most optimal point in time. That preserves the value for ourselves as well as the business. Okay. Um... <clears throat> To just put a hand over to Bill, just something that you said there. Um, so with the, the bill um, and the proposals, um, would you foresee that more business transactions would then actually take place in Scotland as compared to, as we have heard uh, already in evidence, uh, some transactions actually then taking place under English law? Um, in, in terms of more in Scotland versus more under English or more in Scotland currently? <laughs> uh, so more in Scotland as compared to the currently, uh, because we have yes, been told, absolutely. right? We have been told that uh, some uh, transactions have taken place under English law because it's been easier yeah, to true. deal with oh, and sorry. less workarounds. Uh, apologies, I did. Yes, I didn't fully understand the question. Yes, absolutely. In some instances, the business deliberately take a, a, a decision to have facility under English law as opposed to Scottish law in order to have that access to finance. So yes, you would see businesses uh, registering their uh, facilities under Scots law, yes. Okay, no, well, thank you. Uh, Bill Kidd. Yeah, <clears throat> and thank you. You've covered a wide range there, actually, and thank you very much for doing so. So basically, um, what I'm hoping um, to find out is where uh, supporters of reforms have stated that they're likely to make access to credit cheaper. Um, do you agree that this will actually be the case in practice? Um, or is this um, just a, a sort of a, a smokescreen for new legislation? So, if I think about it from NatWest's perspective, if I look at the extra legal costs associated with workarounds, uh, because that's the still cost, then yes, uh, elimination of the needs um, of workarounds presents lower legal charges for our customers, which means access to credit is cheaper, uh, for sure. And um, so on that basis then, and I think you did talk about this, um, in your view, businesses in England and other countries have access to a wider range <clears throat> of finance options than we have in Scotland at present. Will this... Um, will this bill open up the options and, as you mentioned earlier, people um, taking the advantage of maybe running things under English law? Do you think this would mean that people would be able to concentrate uh, their their options here in Scotland? Um, 
Yes, I, I believe so, because, you know, we still provide financing under the Scots law for some of the bigger companies in Scotland, as well as the, the middle ones, but even they are facing challenges in terms of um, availability of finance. If, let's, let's, let's try to answer the question with a practical case study. Uh, let's, 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 let's look at the law of pledges in context of asset-based lending, um, when we do leverage uh, planning machinery um, to provide financing. You may have, in terms of characteristics, identical businesses, one operating in Scotland, one operating in England. Because under the English law, I have very, um, um, as I said, other than crown preference, nothing else runs against me. So if I'm giving the asset, I can give a full evaluation of the money available to the customer against that asset you know, in England. In Scotland, so let's say if the asset is worth hundred thousand pounds and I can give sixty thousand pounds because we obviously evaluate those assets not as a going concern but as a uh, accelerated sale um, because I don't need to put any other reserves um, that could be required um, and are required and in Scottish law because I don't effectively have fixed charge here I have a concept of floating charge which means there are other creditors that may rank against ahead of me that availability against 100 k might go as low as 20. So it means that the company in Scotland, whilst they have exactly the same asset, cannot benefit from the same amount of financing um, because of all those extra things that have to be considered from a lender's perspective before we give them the money. Then you need to then think it to yourself, well, what is the point of me even raising the money that way? And a lot of businesses decide it's not worth it. Now. It also puts a lot of businesses at the risk of unnecessary costs when the answer might still be no, because it won't be commercially viable. Of course, we as a lender, we avoid that. So we understand the market. So we will know straight away from the value of the asset, whether this has any legs or not. But there are a lot of providers who may just take the benefit and still charge a business a valuation charge just to give them the answer that your asset is worth very, worth very little uh, for the purpose of financing. So you would also eliminate that unnecessarily costly valuations, which often result in, in a no answer. Okay, well, that's very helpful. And thank you very much indeed for that. That's covered up. Um, just before we move on, um, uh, Colin Boland, do you want to come in on any of the, uh, the points that have just been raised? Um, just, I mean, very quickly, I think Bill Murphy gave a really um, neat summary of, of where we are from the industry point of view, it's really interesting to hear how they're viewing it. I mean, I think, yes, um, should it should this make access to credit cheaper, then yes, if, if, if it goes the way we really want it to go, then um, yes, it will, because, you know, as Mark has outlined, the workarounds do seem disproportionate, particularly when you think about the amount of credit that might be um, an issue. Um, another one of the, you know, the big advantages of this for us is that you're not losing access to business assets um, under the statutory pledge. You know, so for example, you know, the often quoted example is if you have a van that's worth ten thousand pounds and you want to raise five hundred pounds against it, then it's also completely impractical to lose, you know, to lose use of that uh, vehicle until the the loan is repaid. So I think that's going to certainly open up um, a lot more options. And I think the more people that we can encourage into the market and to maybe you know and to sort of try and exploit those new market opportunities, we should be trying a bit of competition. I hope we're trying to get back down. I'd also just like to make a point about um, the floating point charge. Um, uh, also, sorry, the floating charge, um, and some of the limitations around about that as well. Because uh, just again, it's, um, it's a point to be in the mind that that can all be granted by incorporated debtors like companies, limited liability partnerships, etc. So that means that um, it's out of reach of the likes of sole traders and partnerships. Now they account for about 50 odd thousand of the 172,000 registered small businesses in Scotland. Um, and, all, and obviously all of the 165,000 unregistered businesses. So you know, um, it's going to be quite important, I think, that the um, statutory pledge is going to be applicable to unincorporated um, businesses because I think that's where a lot of those acute short term cash flow issues arise where solutions like this might be the most useful. 
Okay, no, thank you. So just before we move on to the next uh, round of questioning, I'm just going to suspend briefly because there's a, a minor technical uh, issue here in the room. So but we will come back uh, very shortly. <coughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Jeremy Balfour. Um, good morning, and again, thank you very much for coming. Uh, maybe I could just ask one question leading on from what we've heard already, and maybe start with Colin, and then if um, others want to come in, that'd be fine. Colin, obviously, um, small businesses, individuals, partnerships can't, at the moment under Scots law, grant floating charges. Now, I think those are a bit of a blunt instrument and that perhaps not used as much as it were previously. But as we look at this, is it something that your members are saying they would like that opportunity to have floating charge, to be able to take a floating charge over their assets, or is this something that will replace that? I would think that given the limitations around the floating charges, I think it would be better if we replace it with something like this, because it's looks on the face of it incredibly straightforward um, and it looks like to be providing the sorts of finance that typically businesses in in that set of circumstances are telling us that they need so yes I, 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 my, my my instinct would be to go with the latter and i can just ask the same question to Merka um in regard to customers you're dealing with uh, who are partnerships or individuals is there any appetite for floating charges to be allowed to be granted by them? No, I think uh, we have not seen that. And I think it's, on, I guess, as Colin, Colin said, there are challenges associated with floating charges for small businesses. If you can allow the assets to be utilised by the business, but allow the funders to have the quasi fixed charge against that assets, that's better for all parties involved. Thank you. Thank you, Camilla. OK. Uh, but um, you got... Which one? Other one? Yeah. Um, I wonder if I could just move on to another area and again maybe um either or both of you want to take this uh, and that is at, at the moment the um uh, bill doesn't deal with um shares um, and other assets such as that because the government of view that it doesn't have legal competency to grant that um have you a view on that and do you think the bill should be extended to be able to deal with shares as well Uh, probably, um, it, it's. I, I understand the challenges in terms of the uh, charges of the shares. As a lender, we tend not to take those because only in very, very um, complex structured finance transactions. Uh, if, if we're thinking about small businesses or medium-sized businesses, taking charges against businesses' shares um is is not something that lenders want to do these days so uh, i think from from that west perspective i don't think that um, makes any um, any difference in how businesses would access finance hence um and we have not seen a demand of businesses saying hey i want to stake up my company for you um it might uh, have different implications to investors um, and their view might be different to those that of the banks, of course, um, because they do obviously <laughs> take equity stakes in businesses in order to propel the growth agenda. Um, so probably that question is better directed at, at investors as opposed to traditional lenders. 
OK, thank you. Um, the other thing I just wanted to cover is in regard to the new register and how it will actually work in practice. Um, and a question to both of you. Um, I mean, are you satisfied that the register set out in the bill provide the information needed both for lenders um, and for those who are granting it? And do you have any suggestions on how they could be improved? I mean, from our point of view, we don't have any firm views on that. I think it's just going to be one of these ones where if the overall package makes this option more attractive than the alternatives, then people will go for it and people will use it and will deliver the bill's aims. Um, but in terms of how best to design that, how, by how to maybe look at any appropriate fee structure or what information should be recorded, um, I'm not sure. Well, we still don't have any firm views on it at this stage, um, but if there's any specific questions you think might have particular relevance to small businesses, um, I'm more than happy to take them away and um, get, get his, take some soundings. Um, from my perspective, as, as I think I alluded to earlier, it's about the register being effective and accessible. And accessible also means from, uh, from a cost perspective, of course, um, I think there has to be a balance struck between the amount of information that would be useful to have in such research results when searching the registers uh, and, and, and administration involved in ensuring accurate information is included. Um, I would definitely would probably suggest an approach with limited mandatory data fields on registers themselves. So th therefore the functionality to allow clicking through uh, it, to add a document without further information could be possible. So yeah, that would be my suggestion. The limited number of mandatory fields um, that are in those registers. Um, um, and as then it's, it's time of adoption. I think over time, the, the registers will become the, the preferred form of, of registering security interests. Just one follow up again to both of you, Miss. Um, at the moment, the bill will suggest that it's a voluntary update uh, so the register of statutory pledges will be uh, done. Um, so when it's paid off, it will not necessarily automatically show up. Someone will have to do that. Do you think that's realistic within business? Do you think people will actually do that? Or is it one of these things that we will end up with just lists and lists of um, pledges, which actually have been paid off, but have never actually been taken off the register? It's, it's a fair challenge. Um, I can comment from an English law side as well. <laughs> Currently, I think it's statutory for us to remove the pledges when the loan has been paid in terms of security. And the banks notoriously were slow in removing those security interests. So um, I think either way, uh, financial institutions should, there, should have their own code of conduct on this and, and really promptly remove any security interests from facilities that have been repaid. But you can make it statutory. It doesn't necessarily will have the same the, the effect and necessarily going to work because we're seeing it under the English law, the challenges of, of removing security interest in timely manner. So, so that's probably a way of answering the question. Um, it's uh, making it statutory won't harm and definitely will help small businesses to show they're free, free of any pledges but whether the legal construct will have a desired effect, that yet to be seen. Yeah, I think if you make it as easy as possible to do it, that will that'll drive, um, drive traffic, get people do it. I'm fairly sure from a borrower's point of view as well, you know, if you have, say, £500 outstanding on your van, which is essential for your work, the day that's paid off, you would be pretty clear, clear, you know, pretty keen to have that removed because you might want to raise other finance or, or you just may want to demonstrate that you're not carrying any, any charges of it. So I think there's quite a strong motivation factor there from, from the borrower um, in those circumstances um, to want to do it. So yeah, you really don't have to make it you know, statutory with everything that then goes with that. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Camina. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Paul. Thanks very much to both of you for, for coming along this morning. Um, I just wanted to touch on one area that we've been discussing with other witnesses that's maybe not exactly in your purview, but it'd be interesting to get your insights nonetheless. The main area of controversy in relation to the bill is how it should apply to consumers. 
Um, the committee has heard concerns from witnesses in the last couple of weeks about the risk the bill could facilitate a high-cost lending market, basically virtual pawnbroking um, for consumers using the statutory pledge. Um, comparisons were made to logbook loans in England. Um, so just to, you know, whilst bear in mind there's no fixed definition of a consumer in consumer legislation, the definitions in both the Consumer Credit Act of 1974 and the Consumer Scotland Act 2020 cover sole traders. This is because when buying goods and services outside their area of expertise, sole traders can be at risk from the same sort of information imbalance as individual citizens. Um, so bearing in mind that issue of additional protections for sole traders, do you think that there is a risk or a concern that the reforms proposed in the bill will open up a high cross lending market for consumers and sole traders with loans secured on both household items and items that might be business critical for a sole trader? And do you have any views on how likely this might be? Yeah, I think, I think Paul, you're absolutely right to flag that up. And it was one of the things, I mean, I remember years and years ago when we were speaking to the Scottish Law Commission about this, it was one of the things that we had said, because of course, notwithstanding the issues about protections, for sole traders, we were talking about making sure that individuals would be able to um, access the remedies um, that were been put forward. And that was the first thing that drops is about how, how do you then stop, you know, someone um, seeing their, you know, their, their three feet speed and march through the house um, because of, you know, because of the, the raised money, I guess, and things like that. Now, I said, it's not my area of expertise, it's not something we've looked at in any great detail. I, they, at the time, as I recall the conversation, um, they had thought they seemed to have thought of this in quite a lot of detail, and they seemed to think that there was going to be a lot of sort of statutory protections to get into the um, and safeguards going into the bill. Because I think you know we you know, all know what we're trying to avoid. You know, as you say, we're trying to avoid making this a you know a, a one sharks charter. Um, at the same time, not excluding those very small micro businesses who might be quite difficult to um, determine from the individual consumer because again one of the things about small business finance is how much of it is bound up in your own personal finances how many people are using things like personal credit cards and you know and other personal um, uh, finance options to keep the road you know to keep the business going and also especially at micro um, stage and the startup stage you know, what, what is your household asset? What is the what what is a business asset? So it's it's a really um, you know it, it's a tricky one to reflect what happens I suppose in that sort of day to day world, and yet I capture that in statutory text. Um, but I think what we you know from our point of view we you know, we just need to be clear that we can't live it. The you know the you know one one of the big advantages of this is that we're going to open up. Um, a form of finance to unincorporated bodies, um, and I think that's that is definitely to be a major price. So that would be the one thing we would very very keen to um, to um, to safeguard against. Okay. Uh, I agree, with Colin. Uh, it, it's it's a fair challenge for sure. Um, however. Um, we already mentioned the Consumer Credit Act protections will stand, and again, it's not my uh, strong area of expertise. But also, we know very shortly we are we going to have consumer duty, uh, and consumer duty also provides further protections. So I think the overall legislative framework to protect businesses like small small traders with both the CCA as well as the consumer duty, um, I think will make it harder for people willing to exploit uh, this uh, welcome change into the law. Hmm. Thanks for that. Um, I guess just to be clear, um, would you be particularly concerned if consumers were excluded from the ambit of the bill? Uh, from, from my perspective, I am a business lender. I operate in a business that I would not have an opinion. So, <laughs> um, I think um, I'm not aware of NatWest's plans to expand this level of financing through these means. Um, we have other options of providing consumer finance, uh, which uh, so far have proven successful. But I think that's as far as I can go with my commentary on this. Colin? Yeah. 
Colin, do you have yeah. any views? Do you get any thoughts? So, sorry, um, everything froze there. I was, I was oh, sorry about that. Yes, everything froze. Um, I, I, I got to think about, about um, 30 sure. seconds into his answer there. So, what was the. We were just saying, um, would you be, have any particular concerns if consumers were excluded from the ambit of the bill? Yeah. I think, I mean, if define consumers, I suppose, um, this is the thing, that, it, it, it's, it's difficult for us yeah. because so much of, particularly at that very small stage, at that early stage, um, how, how, how would one define that, I suppose? Um, that's the issue. But at the same time, you know, I have absolutely no interest in, um, you know, making things easier for, you know, for loan sharks or insurance operators or, or anything like that, particularly at the current, um, the current time when we know how hard-pressed finances are and people will be looking, you know, at, at every option, no matter how extreme, um, you know, to, to keep things together um, uh, as, we, as we try and get... I would never say the inflation crisis, you know, but um, but I think my yeah, I we, we we would have a strong concern if it looked like this would be a way to limit access to business finance to the to the smallest firms because that's at the end of the day where our interest in this bill comes from. Mm -hmm. Um, just taking that on about the issue about limiting finance to, to small business small firms even considering sole traders sole traders are excluded from consumer protections contained in the bill do you agree with that approach and i know mark has suggested that there were other legislative remedies there or protections that could come in but um just interested to get both of your thoughts on that exclusion from consumer protections in the bill yeah i'm, I'm not sure they firm using that okay i think the consumer duty again will will help that. And that's exactly the reason why the regulators are pushing for consumer duty with the, the salt traders in, in the heart of, of that legislative change. Uh, because Colin is right, salt traders should not be excluded from access to finance, but equally they should be under the protection of certain remedies that are available under the CCA. But I, I, I do know that consumer duty goes beyond that and, and provides those remedies in the future. Thanks for that. There's, there is one scenario, though, that, that the um, the bill would create that might be problematic. I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. That a, a lender would not need a court order to seize items pledged by a sole trader or small business in the event that they missed payments on their loan. Um, would you be happy that greater protection, which might obviously consequentially come with a higher interest rate, is not needed? Mm. It's a bit of a balance to strike, I suppose. But... Uh, it's a really good question, Paul. Um, it's really interesting. It's probably one I would need to take away and consider in a bit more detail. Um, just exactly about how it would, how, what you say, that practical example, how, how, how would that work and how would the various rights and protections um, fit together in that one. But um, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to explore that in, in more detail um, if you think that would be helpful. That would be appreciated, and if there's any proposals around protections that might be appropriate um, or proportionate in terms of um, when a, a seizure could take place, for example, you know, um, that would be helpful. Um, Mark, have you any thoughts on that? Uh, from a mainstream bank perspective, not just NatWest, we would never, we would never do that. But you then need to ask yourself, what about any independent providers? Would that create a, and I don't really have an answer, I'm only going to come back to you with the challenge. Would that create an opportunity for some third party companies acting as aides to those independent third party providers uh, with the seizures of assets? Hmm. You could ask yourself that challenge without any protection. So potentially is, is, the, is the parallel market, financing market that could exist alongside mainstream financing. Mm. Um, and that's definitely a challenge because um, we've seen it in the past. Things like that, without protections, sometimes do get exploited. Yeah, that's really helpful insight. Particularly, like what the what the best practice would be from mainstream lending institutions, um, and what we could design to ensure that nothing can be used to outflank that. That would be really helpful. Um, if there's any further thoughts on how. Yeah, so we already have evidential standards. We have to provide reasons as to why we're providing facilities to customers that they do receive fair value for money. All, all those things already are part of the regulatory regime. Um, and and, and the, that, that's absolutely the case. 
some of the legislation is not as far reaching to necessarily independent providers. Um, but FCA is definitely trying to combat that as well uh, in terms of financial conduct of those independent providers. And I think, again, the, the duty, the, the consumer duty uh, is, is looking to address that across the spectrum of all the providers. Whether you're going to have some uh, time lapse is the question that will allow any meaningful time for exploitation. Um, probably not, but it's not, so definitely something for consideration. Okay, well, thanks very much for that. I appreciate your, your, your thoughts. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, so, certainly, uh, so Colin, uh, if you can come back to the committee before uh, next Tuesday, please, on that particular uh, question from Paul, that would be very helpful because we've got the minister in front of us next Tuesday. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, thank you. I've uh, just got a couple of uh, final questions. Um, so, the, the financial memorandum uh, suggests that fees for using the registers will be in the range of between 10 and 80 pounds. Do you think that that's uh, the sort of level that will actually encourage the usage? And this is uh, for the registers. Colin? I don't have any views. Um, I think, I mean, it's one of these ones where if we get, if it, I think if, it, if you look at the overall package, the overall package is cheaper in the round. So in terms of the actual pounds that you're spending and the time you're investing, then yes, I think businesses will see this as a, you know, uh, yeah, let, let's let's use this as a reasonable option. Um, and if it's not, it won't. So I think, I mean, I suppose the, the, the challenge for registers of Scotland will be just to keep it under review, make sure they have the right balance between covering the cost, but not discouraging use. So in terms of where that line should be drawn, um, no, I don't have any opinion. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mirka? Uh, just, just please remind me, what was the upper range? 10 to 18 uh, or 80? Uh, 80, 80. 80, okay. Well, again, comparison, and, and Colin is right, is well, what is that in the overall scheme of, of the cost of the facility? Um, um, by memory, um, charges to companies' house are far greater than that, because uh, uh, I, th I think the, the last ones I remember was around £150. So, and that did not prevent any business from happening or, or usage. So probably um, the range you're talking about is, is, is realistic and, and, and should not be a hindrance to usage of the registers. Okay, no, thank you. Uh, and my, my final question, um, it's, um, it's for yourself, uh, Mirka, uh, and, uh, and I'm not expecting an answer um, at, the, at this point, and you might want to come back to the committee. Um, at some point. Um, so, obviously, this is a bill going through the parliamentary process, uh, and the, if the bill were to pass, uh, and the um, uh, and the rollout that then uh, takes place in the future, uh, would NatWest uh, uh, consider uh, having a, kind of a uh, even for a, a short period of time to assist with the rollout? Uh, would NatWest uh, Group consider having kind of a, a favourable? A kind of set of um, lending, um, uh, kind of lending conditions um, and the financial oh. conditions to people uh, and organisations, actually organisations in Scotland, to actually assist with the rollout of the legislation. So, uh, perhaps I can answer it this way. Uh, I think, in short, answer is yes. But the way we would do that is in a compliant way, as we currently do through all the other financial conduct. Uh, rules that we and, and codes of conduct that we play by. So in that situation, if we had a Scottish client, we would absolutely made it a rule and compulsory rule that such customer has to be aware of recent changes in legislation and the customer has optionality as to how they wish to proceed. Absolutely. Whenever we've done that, any any other, you know, this has changed the legislation, but we have a good comparison into for example, schemes available al alongside traditional lending. And we always take the duty to show the customer full range of options available to them. And that's, that's, how, we, that's how we conduct our business. So in that, sense, in, that, in that sense, absolutely, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? No, thank you for that. Thank you. No, okay, so uh, with that panel, uh, thank you very much uh, for your time this morning. Uh, and uh, also for your uh, written submissions. Uh, so with that, I will uh, briefly uh, suspend uh, so we can change to the next panel. So once again, thank you very much, Colin Boland and Mirka Shipchak.
And for our second panel, can I welcome Jennifer Henderson, the Keeper of the Registers of Scotland, who is accompanied by John Hodge, the Policy Lead for RMT, and Kat Haig, the Product Lead for RMT at the Registers of Scotland. Uh, and can I once again remind our witnesses uh, not to worry about switching on the microphones uh, during the session, as these are controlled by broadcasting. And if you would like to come in to any of the questions, please uh, just indicate, raise your hand. That would be helpful. Thank you. So with that, I'll just start off uh, some of the initial questions. So the financial memorandum uh, suggests that the registers will be operational by mid-2024 at a cost of around £8.2 million. Pounds. Are you still on track to deliver that? Uh, thank you for having us today, Convener. Um, yes, we are, but I think one of the things we would note is clearly the timing of the passing of the legislation and the timing of the regulations, our experience of developing other registers, a gap of a year from knowing exactly what we've got to deliver to it being fully operational is what we need. So we're on track with the timetable as we currently understand it for the price that we're currently working to. Thank you. And what consultation have you done with potential users to ensure that the registers actually meet their needs? So I'm going to hand to my colleague Kat, who's leading on the product development, who will talk about our user experience work. Yep. Um, thank you. Yep. So we've done a broad range of user research over our um, discovery and alpha periods, and I, I can talk a bit about what those are as well. Um, we've spoken with a range of solicitors and lenders who we have identified as being our, our top users. Um, we also are aware and we are working to the assumption at the moment currently that um, individuals, so citizens, are included as within the scope of the legislation. And it's our intention in the next stage of our, the project, which is our, our beta phase, um, to do some research with, with uh, private individuals, with citizens as well. Um, We've undertaken a, a number of um, individual um, interviews with users, as well as prototype sessions. So that is basically um, showing users what we've built, so testing some concepts and different ideas with them and getting feedback on that, and then iterating the prototypes and amending them based on the feedback that we've received. So to date, we've spoken with around um, 50 different users across a, that kind of range, not only um, solicitors and lenders, but we've also spoken with academics and we've spoken with um, industry experts, um, valuation firms for, for things like assets as well. Um, and we've also um, done a bit of work with the, the Law Commission and the Law Society of Scotland as well. Okay, no, thank you for that. So certainly with the, the dialogue and, and consultations that you've had uh, with the wide range uh, of organisation individuals, uh, have you been able to uh, get a, a clearer picture of the likely demand for registering the assignations and the statutory pledges on the registers? Yeah, so I think it's in terms of the, the usage estimates, it's similar to um, what the BRIA in 2017 had suggested. Obviously, we've been doing a bit of work, um, we've had to do a bit of work in terms of um, I suppose we've been making people aware of this legislation as well. We've, we've been speaking with sort of financial counterparts in England as well and just making them aware that this, this legislation is coming. So I think as the awareness grows as well, it will increase awareness of, of what, basically what the scope of what people can do under this legislation. As that grows, I think there will be higher demand for using the registers. So we might not get the, the sort of estimated figures from um, in the first year from day one, but I think that will grow over time. That certainly seems to um, be, be borne out in our research. Okay, well, thank you. And certainly, this committee has heard um, from, uh, from, from the money advice sector uh, regarding the issue of the searches uh, of the registers to actually be free. Um, is that feasible within the current budget, um, or uh, could a two-tier system be operational, i.e., for those who are money advice? Uh, experts for them to have kind of, uh, access free, but potentially others to an MP? So I think overall it's obviously a matter for ministers and for parliament how they want to set the fee structure. From a Registers of Scotland point of view, we would expect to be able to cover our costs for running the register from the totality of fees charged. So if there was to be a different fee structure, if certain people would have free access to search and so on, 
we would just have to take that into account in the overall funding for the registers and ultimately if there's a gap in our funding between what it costs us to deliver the registers and um, the fees we have coming in from the registers it would be for the Scottish Government to cover that gap in funding however they saw fit but yeah we don't we don't have an explicit opinion about exactly how the fee structure should be set up other than the point about covering our costs. Okay thank you. Um, Bill Kidd. Um, thank you very much and thank you for being here today. Um, so there are some stakeholders <clears throat> um, who uh, have made um, made it known to the in the committee's call for views um, that there should be links between the registers in the bill um, and yourselves and companies' house. And you obviously know about that, because I saw you nodding there, thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, and this would be in order to avoid companies um, having to register for financial arrangements twice. Um, are you actually considering this at all? Um, or would it, and because I mean, some uh, some of those who would have to register would not have to, no, not wish to actually have to register with more than one body, because um, that's a, a complication for them. Um, would you really be considering this? So I think there's there's two parts to that. I mean, my colleague John, I'll briefly get him to speak to the current provisions. So there isn't currently a provision to require us to put the link in, um, and John can expand a little bit on that. Technically, Kat can come in on, could we do it? Yes, we could, if there was provision in the bill that required us to put the links in. We could do that, but at the moment we're not considering it because it's it's not something that's in the bill. But I don't know, John, whether you just want to briefly expand on on that linkage yeah, question. Yeah, sure. Right, good morning. Uh, yeah, it's something certainly something we would like to do, but uh, I think it would require an amendment to the Companies Act, which is not a, a devolved act, and so it requires an order under that act. Our understanding is that the, the, the bill team within the Scottish Government have made contact with UK Government on this issue, but as yet no information is forthcoming. But certainly, as, as the Keeper says, it's something we'd like to do, and, and if, if it happens, we can accommodate it. Thank you. And would you like, Kat, would you just like to briefly explain technically how we do it? Yeah, of course. So um, we're also looking to build APIs, which are application as an application program and interface into our service, which allows us basically allows um, two sort of software systems to talk to each other. So it technically is possible, um, but what I would say is we haven't, as Jennifer said, we've not scoped this work out yet because it's not part of the the bill as it currently stands. So we haven't scoped out that work and we, we haven't kind of had those conversations, but we do have a good relationship with Companies House. So it is something we could investigate. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that indeed. Um, can I just ask why, because I think all three of you said it's something that you would wish to consider. Can I ask what benefits it would actually bring to Register Scotland um, to actually have this, this linkage, please? So, I mean, I think, as you've alluded to, I mean, the primary benefit would be that people who would need to register twice wouldn't, wouldn't need to do that. They'd be able to register once and copy it across. And I guess from a Registers of Scotland point of view, that removes the possibility of people introducing errors by actually, if they have to register twice, they, they don't quite get it right in both places. And then we end up having to put time and effort into making corrections. So I think our view would be if there is, if there is a possibility of people registering something once and that is something that's going to be made provision for and as John says can be done legally it makes the quality of the data better overall. That makes a lot of sense right thank you very much thanks for that thank you. Um, just before I hand over to uh, Jeremy um, I assume there wouldn't be any issues regarding uh, kind of data protection or GDPR um, also the two separate organisations uh, if there were to be the uh, uh, in yeah, input once and then it's then transferred over to the other. So John again may wish to come in but where we do have, um, where we take data from other organisations which we do in other places, we have appropriate data sharing arrangements in place and either end knows what's provided and their customers know what's provided and that all gets sorted out as part of that. But John do you want to Yeah, no, Exactly to that, that the, the order that would be made under the Companies Act would, would, would cover that and as Jennifer says that agreements and memorandums of understanding would, would cover the, the, the specific detail. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, Jeremy. Uh, thank you, Gavinia, uh, and good morning uh, to the panel. Um, you will have heard in the first panel, um, I was asking about um, the voluntary nature around the register. Uh, so when a pledge, a pledge has been discharged, will it happen, or will it just build up more and more? Um, do you think the voluntary approach will work? Or would you want to see some statutory 
limitation put on it? I'll, I'll start, but I'll get John to come in on the technical detail. I mean, the way the legislation's currently drafted, the, rem the removal of a pledge is, is voluntary. Um, either the lender would request to remove it or much more likely, in my opinion, the person who's given the pledge would want it taken off because they wouldn't want it recorded, which is actually in common with how standard securities mortgages worked. When you've discharged your mortgage on your property, you request to have it removed from the register and the lender signs up and we register that deed. Um, so we certainly could do that, but um, that is a, a voluntary arrangement there as well. But John, do you want to, to come in with sort of how we would see the legislation would need to be amended to make provision if it were to C be compulsory? So th this is an issue that the, the law, law Commission themselves wrestled with, the, the, the balance between having a, a register that has utility and also a not being a clog in business, I think, I think was the phrase the Law Commission used by requiring discharges to be registered every time a pledge is expired. Uh, the bill as it stands would mean that pledges would last in, in, in perpetuity. I think we have, we have no views uh, on, on, on when, when the, what, what the position should be, uh, but what we what we intend to do is monitor how the register matures over time and whether the number of entries on that register starts to affect the searchability of the register and, and the usability, and we'd feed that back. But ultimately, it'll be a decision, I think, for, for ministers and government to make based on a balance between the utility of the registers and ease of doing business. I mean, I would, I would imagine for I mean, it's several decades before I practised law, but the, the, when I was practising, you only discharged the standard security, or you only really put the document forward when you were selling the property. So often you would pay off your mortgage, but it would be years later you would bring forward the discharge. I suppose my fear is just picking up John's final point, is that we end up with a register which is so large it's almost impossible to find anything. I, I, is that a danger? It could be a danger, and I think, I mean, there's obviously provision in the legislation for, for ministers to make secondary legislation that would... Um, introduce changes to how updates on the statutory pledges would need to be made and one of the things we could certainly supply as part of that is the data about how the register is being used how many pledges are on it that you know we think might have expired and things like that so ministers could decide whether they would want to bring in a, a compulsory element to at later stage if they don't do it by amending the bill at the current point okay thank you um just one other final point. Scottish ministers will also have a power to set the duration of registration for statutory pledges. Um, the Faculty of Advocates in their submission have suggested that asking creditors to set the timescale when they register would be a better approach. Is this something that you could facilitate if the legislation changed? Mm -hmm. John, do you want to come in? Yes, absolutely. So uh, the, the bill, as Jennifer mentioned, the, the, the bill as it stands allows uh, ministers to make regulations which would, would time expire excuse, and also to facilitate renewal applications. And both of those are certainly th something that we could accommodate in the system. We could, the system will be largely automated and if, if there was a time period, and e even if that was set at the point of application, we could ensure that those were uh, removed on an automated basis. Grateful. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, yeah, thank you. And Paul. Thank you, convener, and thanks to everyone for, for coming along today. Um, we just wanted to cover also um, privacy and consumer um, issues around protection of information. Um, so obviously the registers will put personal information such as the name and address of an individual assignor or pledge provider into the public domain. Um, the assignation record will also contain the assignation document containing the details of the assignation. And in some cases, this may enable um, individual customers to be identified and indeed anyone can search the registers if they pay the required fee. So I think the government has acknowledged that there are privacy issues. Paragraph 107 of the policy memorandum suggests that Scottish ministers may consider limiting some search options or keeping certain information confidential in particular context to protect privacy. Um, and also separately in evidence we've had consumer and money advice organisations have highlighted concerns that the registers may contain information which is prejudicial to the interests of consumers. For example, there are frequent dispute, uh, disputes between individuals and creditors about the accuracy of information held by credit reference agencies. Advice Direct Scotland raised concerns that the information in the registers could be used to make taking debt enforcement action easier or could be used by credit reference agencies in a way that had a negative impact on consumers. Uh, ADS also raised concerns that the registers could contain out-of-date information about loans taken out by an individual and it called for clear and effective processes to correct errors and settle disputes. It would be possible to use the process set out in sections 96 and 97 of the bill um, to force a correction of the registered statutory pledges. However, 
If a creditor disagreed, the dispute would go to court and there's no process set out in the bill for making corrections to the Register of Assignations. So just to touch on these issues that have been raised by, by evidence we've heard so far from other, from other contributors, the registers will contain significant amounts of personal information. So what measures are being planned to protect individuals' privacy? So obviously, overall, the sort of balance between the public interest in having a register and the privacy of the individuals who are on that register is, is a matter for ministers and, and where they want to set exactly what goes on the register, what's searchable and so on. I would say the way we're building the registers, and Kat would be very happy to expand, we are protecting people's information in the sense that people will only be able to access the register in the prescribed manner, they'll only be able to search against the things that are prescribed, they'll only get returns on the information that you know, matches their search criteria. So that ability, you know, someone isn't going in and scrolling through the entire register and able to see everything in it. And certainly from a cyber security point of view, we will be building in excellent protections to make sure that that information is held securely and so on. But we will also be building a register that meets the requirements as in the bill in terms of what information is provided to people when they search, what they can search against. Um, and obviously, if, if, if between now and when the bill is passed, there are adjustments to that, Kat and her team can accommodate, you know, changing the search fields, that sort of thing, so that it matches exactly what we're supposed to be supplying. Um, but yeah, we, we, I guess it's an emphasis on my role as registrar is, a, is an administrative role in relation to setting up and delivering these registers, making the information in them publicly available as prescribed in, in the Act, nothing more and nothing less. Okay. Uh, I, suppose a, I suppose a similar example might be like the DVLA's database and how insurance companies might be able to check that for, you know, people have got points on their licence and haven't declared it in their insurance or whatever. Um, but I suppose that's maybe a similar concern that um, Advice Direct Scotland has raised about um, information in the registers being used in a way that could be in, uh, detrimental to individuals, not necessarily with their knowledge, um, for example, debt enforcement by credit reference agencies. Is this something you've considered and how access um, to the registers can be sort of um, controlled um, so that individuals can have sovereignty over it? So I guess, I mean, we've considered it in the sense that we're, we're building a register that meets the requirements of, of the bill as currently written. That allows anyone who wishes to, to go in and search the register. There's no limitation at the moment on the types of organisation who can search. Um, I would say it's back, back to the question about a fee for searching. One of the elements of having a fee for searching is it does just discourage people spending their days going in, you know, looking up the names of the neighbours in their street or whatever to find out about their financial affairs. But, um, yeah, our, our, our overall view is we're delivering what's currently in, in the bill. John, did you want to come in any more on the policy aspects of this? Yeah, I can just touch upon a couple of the points you mentioned, that the bill makes some mitigations around the privacy concerns. Obviously, mm -hmm. registration as a policy solution, by definition, involves publicity, so those mitigations are important. Uh, in, in terms of searching, you mentioned date of, date of birth is one of the, the pieces of information that applicants have to, to, to provide, but that can't be searched in, in isolation. It can only be searched in conjunction with a name, and even then only the month and, and, and the year, so that prevents parties from potentially scraping the register for, for, for information. And also you can only assign, you can only search for the, the, assignee, the assignee or the creditor. You can't Sorry, you cannot search the assigning other creditor, and that would prevent people from scraping the register, perhaps to build up customer lists of of, 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 of lending institutions. But I think where the most of the mitigations lie will be in the, the regulations that will follow the bill, which which will set out most of the framework of how the registers operate, and they provide the uh, provision to allow rules to make uh, certain parts of the document that the applicants upload not to be not necessarily to be submitted so for example applicants could perhaps redact parts of documents that they upload and that would be fine that wouldn't affect the effectiveness of registration and also uh, the rules can provide that certain info contained in the register doesn't necessarily need to be disclosed in a search or, or an extract so date of birth is, is perhaps a good example for that so date of birth will be captured for id purposes and to enhance the searchability but when someone actually searches the register what will be returned won't be a uh, date of birth won't be won't be there so that's something i think we'll, we'll certainly consult with parties as we develop those regulations and, and what other uh, pieces of, of mitigation we can put in place to, 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 to satisfy everyone um obviously one of the other thanks for that and, and obviously one of the other concerns um that was raised was around making sure that the data, the data held in the registers is accurate and can be updated easily 
Um, so those concerns about you know registers containing disputed or out of date information, um, which could have a negative impact on individuals. Um, do you think there is a need for improvement to how user friendly um, corrections and dispute resolution processes can be, um, as exists for credit reference information? Yeah, and so the bill as currently drafted obviously sets out a, a correction procedure, how people can apply to me to have the, the record corrected and, and, and stipulates you know, who, who those people can be. I think it's important to emphasise I don't have a judicial role. It can't be for me to determine if there is a dispute between two parties about the accuracy of the record I hold. It's not something I will be able to take a view on. But John, do you want to do you want to come in a little bit more on any other yeah, sort of policy so, side around? So this? each of each of the two registers has has their own correction regime. The, the register of assignations is effectively a snapshot in time register. Uh, the only way an, uh, an inaccuracy can be created is if, if the, 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 the information inputted by the applicant at the time uh, is incorrect, or if our IT system makes a mistake, then people can contact us. We'll correct it. That's fine. The statutory pledges register is, is slightly different. Uh, there is a a system of correction applications, as we referred to in the bill, and they relate to things like uh, restriction, assignation, or discharge, which I think are the ones that are of most most, uh, most interest. And we these will be applications made very similarly to the way that the original registration application is made. They'll be automated. They'll be pretty streamlined. They'll be quick. So we will certainly be looking to make those correction processes as easy for people to facilitate, so that things like discharge, for example, can be done quickly and cheaply. Thank you. Sure. No Thanks uh, for that, Paul, because I just brought something up there I was thinking about. Was, um, a, can I ask, please, how the security of information, um, not about um, the security of information in terms of keeping it from people, but how people would prove that they are the right person, the correct person, to be altering the information that was held? Um, I, you know, I'm just concerned that somebody could mess around and use and change somebody else's um, information. Um, how would you actually ensure that that was that was handled correctly? Can I ask? So yeah, I'll I'll bring Kat in, but I mean, with our other registers, I mean, we have a we have a verification regime for who is going in and requesting updates to the registers. But Kat, do you want to come in on how we're addressing that aspect? Yes. Yeah, so. Um we have a regime for so our professional users, like lenders and solicitors, for example, are authenticated users with us that have accounts and we verify them. Um, and they have access to our online services and they can they can go in and they you know they can make registrations, they can do amendments and that sort of thing as well. I think the question that we have at the minute and, and what we're investigating is if um, individuals are included as, as part of, of, of the legislation is um, how we would verify them and, and how they would come in and you know safely and um, authenticated in an authenticated way how they would make changes to um, to the register. So that's something that we are um, investigating um, at present. And um, just to ensure that, yeah, we, we don't get into the situation where, you know, anybody can access uh, information and, and make changes. You know, if there's anything you want to add, John? Yeah, all just worth noting that those correction applications I made reference to, they can only be made by the secured creditor. They can't be made by other parties. Being addressed. So thank yeah, you yeah. for that. Thank you. Thank you. Jeremy? Yeah, just if I can come back to a point you just made there earlier, Jennifer, just to, just to clarify my own mind around this. In regard to what powers you have, in regard to there was obviously some issues initially when the land registration was rolled out about arguments about was that the right piece of land, who owned what, and where were the boundaries. In regard to this, what powers do you have if someone says, well, actually, I didn't grant a security over that, or this fraudulent behaviour to investigate that? Is that something you have power to do, or do you simply refer it back to another body? It isn't something I have power to do. I mean, the, the, the tests, as, as defined in the bill, of my ability to correct is it's manifestly inaccurate and, it, you know, I need and I know what I would need to do to correct it. Um, if there's any dubiety about that, I mean, if, for example, if there was an allegation of fraud, we would be referring people to the police as the appropriate authority to take that through. As we do with our other registers, if someone comes to us and says they think there's a fraud happened, we don't have powers to investigate that. John, do you want to add anything on the policy side as defined? Yep, just exactly that, that the keeper's role in, t in terms of this register is a bit different from the land register in that it is almost entirely administrative. 
uh, and that's reflected also in the liability provisions in the keeper in, in the bill, which which are very clear that the keeper is entitled to rely on the information provided to her by applicants. It doesn't interrogate it in the way that we, we interrogate land register information. Yeah, and I, if I may just add, I think one of the other things, and, and Kat's alluded to the sort of professional users who will primarily be the people. They, they will tend to be people in regulated roles who have a duty of care to the people they're supporting, will have rigorous, you know, fraud regimes to check and things like that. So our anticipation is the due diligence around all of that is absolutely done upstream. It doesn't mean it can't happen, but, you know, it, it's something that it's not going to be for us to investigate. If someone comes to us and alleges a fraud, we can just signpost them to the, the right place to get that looked into. Thank you. Okay, no, thank you. Uh, and just kind of a final question from myself. Um, it kind of follows on from a, an earlier line of questioning. Um, I think it was from uh, from Jeremy. Um, if uh, at some point in the future um, it, it felt as if that the, the registers themselves actually weren't being updated, that people weren't uh, the, they weren't being removed from the, the registers, uh, what would your process be uh, to contact the the lenders um, to for them to well to to ask them uh, for clarification on uh, particular uh, instances or examples of um, of individuals who potentially are still on the register that really shouldn't be. What would mm. your process be? Do you, John, do you want to come in, I guess, on what currently there is sort of provision for us to do, and if if sure. there were, and, and if if a regime came in from an amendment, what what that would be, or the minister decided sure, to make so powers under this? There is no current power that would allow us to, to contact contact lenders. What the bill does do, though, is it does allow in addition to correction applications by by the, the secured creditor themselves, it also allows the provider to ask the secure, secured creditor to, dis, to to correct that application to, to discharge it in, in, in all likelihood. Uh, if the creditor doesn't comply with that, the provider can come straight to the keeper uh, and, and ask us to, to remove And there's a process set out in the bill that, which involves notification of the creditor that, that, that we can do. Uh, if, if, if the bill was to be changed or a subsequent amendment to the Act once in place, uh, that, that, that meant that these correction applications were, were statutory and had a statutory basis, uh, then, then that, that's something we could accommodate. Although it's worth noting just now that the that whilst registration of a statutory pledge is required for it to have effect, the other changes such as discharge or assignation don't require registration to have effect, so that would also require quite a significant change to the bill in terms of effect of registration. Okay, no, thank you. Um, do you have any other questions? No. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you. So, uh, so with that, can I thank um, Jennifer Henderson, John Hodge and Kat Haig for their help this morning. And as with the first panel, the committee may follow up my letter uh, with any additional questions stemming from uh, today's session. So with that, thank you very much. And I will now suspend the meeting briefly to allow the panel to leave.
Under agenda item number three, we're considering two instruments subject to the affirmative procedure. No points have been raised on either the draft pavement parking prohibition exemption orders procedure, Scotland Regulations 2022, SSI 2022 draft, or the draft international organisations immunities and privileges Scotland Amendment Order 2022. Is the committee content with these instruments? Yes. And at agenda item number four, we're considering two instruments subject to the negative procedure. No points have been raised on SSIs 2022, 288 and 294. Is the committee content with these instruments? Yes. And at agenda item number five, we're considering two instruments not subject to any parliamentary procedure. No points have been raised on SSIs 2022, 289 and 295. Is the committee content with these instruments? Yes. Yep. And under agenda item number six, we're considering a document laid before the Parliament for approval. No points have been raised on the Environmental Standards Scotland Strategic Plan ESS 2022-03. Is the committee content with this document? Yes. Thank you. And uh, just before we do move into the private session, uh, I'd like to uh, have a moment to say uh, on the record uh, the committee's thanks to Andy Proudfoot. Andy will be leaving the Scottish Parliament at the end of this week, having supported the work of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee over the past four years. Andy's enthusiastic and dedicated approach to his work has won him respect and appreciation of all those he has worked with over his time in the Scottish Parliament. Andy, on behalf of the members of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, certainly this session and also previous sessions, I'd like to thank you for your excellent hard work and we wish you all the very best for the future. And with that, I will bring the public part of the meeting to a close and we'll continue in private. Thank you.